today, and you all get to listen. Uh, I think it should be that way every time, but I want to emphasize that because the way that this message came about was exactly like that. Um, with, uh, I'd like to give you the title of my message, if we can bring it up. And there's a the title there, so Breaking the Selfie, Break the Selfie, Make the Selfless. Okay? Break the Selfie, Make the Selfless. Channeling, and I've got a subtitle. You know, I had about three titles for this message. I couldn't work out which way to go, so I came up with a big one. Uh, and there's a subtitle there, Channeling Your Love in the Right Direction. Channeling Your Love in the Right Direction. So, um, I've come to the point in my life, I've been in, I've been in church, I could say all my life, and uh, I've come to the point in my life where I feel like I need to unlearn some things. Um, when it comes to the church, uh, the church of God needs to evolve. The church of God needs to change with what the things that God wants to do in the church. Jesus taught this very clearly when he said that the new wine could not be put into old skins. So... Uh, that doesn't mean that you and I get something from God for a season. Uh, we need to be changing our skins in order to receive the new things that God is doing in our lives. And so I've come to, uh, you know, I've questioned my life. I've come to the point where I'm, I'm questioning myself. And this is what I said to God. God, you're coming back soon. What is it that I'm supposed to be doing? I feel like I'm, you know, running out of time. And at the same time, I feel like I'm not being as effective as you want me to be. I don't feel fulfilled or satisfied. And I feel that there is more that I have to do before you come and take your church. Like I said, I'm, I'm preaching to myself and you get to listen. <laughs> um. And so, you know, I, I thought, God, I, I like what I'm doing now. I, I get to, you know, minister the word of the Lord in your house. I minister in worship. I run a connect group. And I know that uh, this, these are some of the things that you want me to do, God. But I don't feel like, I don't feel satisfied. I don't feel like, uh, I, I almost feel like I, I need to do more, Lord. I can, I can do more. Um, is there something I'm, I'm missing and then I ask myself this question, Lord, where is my fruit? The Bible talks about uh, Jesus going up to a fig tree when he was hungry and there was no fruit in the, in the tree and he cursed it. Now, how does that look for my life? How does that look for our lives? So I ask God, am I bearing the fruit that you want me to bear Am I supposed to be bearing more? Am I a good tree to you? Are you satisfied with me, Lord? One thing that I want to make clear from where to go, and I want to lay this foundation to you, is that there is nothing that you and I can do to gain the righteousness of God. If, if there was something that we could do, then Jesus died in vain. So let's get that clear, that salvation and the only way that we get to heaven is through Jesus and us accepting his righteousness and the sacrifice that he has done. That we can do nothing to get to heaven, it's through him, right? Now, anything else misses the mark except the sacrifice of Jesus. So, where there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves, the Bible does talk about things that people do or how they react when they have found Jesus. So uh, we're going to, I'm going to try not to, uh, not to jump ahead of myself, try and stick to my notes as closely as I can. Uh, if we are religious, we will always have a void. The rich young ruler, which I will be referring to a lot in this message, said to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And so this is coming from a guy who practiced all the commandments, but something still didn't feel right with him. So he must have said, am I missing something? 
I'm going to go and ask Jesus. And this is the question that I have for us today. Are we missing something? But the doing part is not as important as to reveal what's behind the action. So once again, I, I raise this question, Lord, what is the church meant to look like when you come back? And do I look like that? The book of Acts talks about the birth of a church. It is a powerful church. It is a glorious church. It's a miraculous church, and it's also a persecuted church. The book of Acts paints a picture of the church birthed by the Spirit of God. Um, I would like us to try and make a comparison today that if there was a story written about the church in 2015, how would that story go? What would the picture look like? What can be said about us? What would be written about us? I think the story uh, about our church, or the church, would probably focus more on what happens in the services than what happens from Monday to Friday. But if we look at the book of Acts, the book of Acts focuses more on what they were doing outside the church, right? And then, yeah, there, there is things that are written in the, you know, about the synagogues and, and how the Lord would add to the church and how they would gather together. But all the work that happened, it happened from Monday to Friday or Saturday and Sunday. Um, so for this reason, I believe that God needs to break some molds and mindsets that for years have not produced the desired amount of fruit. We need to prune the dead rituals and ask God to breathe life as we obey His will. And so how do we know what the church needs to look like and how do we get there? Uh, once Jesus had um, made 12 disciples and He left the earth, He told them and He gave them the Great Commission. And this is... This is how you're going to do it. This is how you're going to start the church. You know, you're going to go out, you're going to preach the gospel, baptize, you know, everybody. And, and he gave them the great commission. Now, before doing this, he said that they needed to go to Jerusalem and be filled of the Holy Spirit. And so the promise of the church that Jesus had in mind was a spirit-filled church. And he said, when he said to Peter that he would build uh, his church on the rock... He said that the gates of hell or Hades would not prevail against the church. And so one of the characteristics of the church that God is coming back for, it's a victorious church. It's not a defeated church. Now, the question is, are we getting the victory not just over our circumstances, but over ourselves, like my sister was saying? Are we getting the victory over ourselves? Are we overcoming ourselves? Are we overcoming the bed, <laughs> the power of the bed? I like that. I like that. Let, let's look at four characteristics of the church of the book of Acts. So here is uh, four characteristics of the church of the book of Acts, and we find this in Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So there's four characteristics there. Okay, so number one there we have the apostles' teaching. And uh, what this would be is uh, they would preach the gospel. When, when the apostles uh, would go out to preach, that's, they would preach about the work of Jesus that they had just witnessed not too long ago. So the work of Jesus is the gospel. So the church back then, was a, ch a gospel-preaching church to unbelievers. Um, now, they had some mindsets as well because they uh, only started preaching to the Jews. It wasn't until Peter got a revelation, and once again, this is the evolving patterns of the church, and, and Peter had that revelation about the food and the, uh, the clean food and the unclean food, and Jesus told them, you, you, basically, you need to preach to everybody, Jews and Gentiles. 
And, and this was a mindset that needed to be broken in them in order for the church to grow and expand to what it needed to be. And I think sometimes that we can be selective about our evangelism. We can be selective about who we speak to. And, and God wants to begin, it's one of the molds that God needs to begin to break in us for us to look a little bit more like the church in the book of Acts. The apostles' proclamation of the gospel was recognized as authoritative, authoritative due to the authentication of God through miraculous works. And uh, in Acts 2.43, do I have that? Yes, I do. Acts 2.43, it says, For there was no one, sorry, uh, re reverential awe came over everyone, and many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. And so the church today, I believe, we need to begin to believe and raise our faith into the miraculous and the supernatural. The church needs to become a church of signs and wonders. If we are going to preach that Jesus heals, we need to believe accordingly. Amen? Now, I was, uh, my parents came over yesterday. And uh, as I was preparing this message, uh, I, was, I always like to bounce things off my parents. Uh, because they, uh, <clears throat> you know, they, they give me some good insight and, and, and great advice. So I was telling mum and dad, look, I'm going to be preaching about this and that. And, uh, you know, my dad, he's, uh, you know, people have always known him as a walking Bible. He, he'll, uh, you can ask him, where is this? And he'll give you the scripture and, you know, where things are. So, um, you know, he, they started telling me some things. And I was, I, was telling to, I was saying to them, look, the church that God is coming back for is going to be a, a church that is miraculous and we're going to see signs and we're going to see wonders. And my mom said, you know what? But not just in the physical. <laughs> she said, son, it's a miracle when God changes somebody from the inside out. It's a miracle to see somebody who was arrogant who was indifferent, and God gets a hold of them and crushes them, and they turn into the most humblest person. And, you know, I think sometimes, you know, I, I was, the, you know, one of thinking, God, I want to see signs, I want to see wonders. And uh, I think God just opened my eyes and said, Son, the church that you have in front of you is a miracle in itself. You are looking at transformed people. You are looking at changed people. And let me tell you, I want to see that miracle not only in you but in me, that we keep on evolving and we keep on transforming. We cannot stay the same. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, number two, number two, the fellowship was another thing that they did. Now, this actually refers to meeting each other's needs. In Acts 4, verses 34 to 37, says, For there was no... No one needy among them because those who were owners of lands and houses were selling them and bringing the proceeds from the sales uh, and placing them at the apostles' feet. Um, I want to move a bit quicker. You, I'm sure that you've read that verse before. But the main point on this that I want to make is that everyone's needs were met. Okay. Um, number three, we also have the breaking of bread. And in Acts 20, 46 says, Every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts, breaking bread from house to house, sharing the food with glad and humble hearts. And uh, let me tell you that uh, one thing is, is for us to greet each other here in the church, um, you know, say, how hey, you're going, spend five or ten minutes. Another thing is to share a meal together. Somehow with the meal, things get a little bit more deeper. Uh, over a meal, uh, you can tell me your problems. Over a meal, I can tell you my problems. Over a meal, I can tell you the things that I'm struggling with and you find out and you can pray for me and you can check on me later and see how I'm doing. This is what the church was doing back then. Uh, number four was the, the, the breaking of bread. Uh, I think I may have made a mistake there. Number four is actually prayers. Okay, that's, that's what the scripture says. So the breaking of bread and prayer. And uh, I really thank God for victory that we are a praying church. I believe that 
There's uh, many other churches there that uh, are not praying churches, but Victory uh, is a praying church. Um, and uh, praise God, we need to overcome the power of the bed and, uh, and get out of here and join uh, with prayer. Now, the danger about all this, I've given you four things that we may need to do. Now, the, the danger in all this is that uh, these functions can become a to-do list and they can become activities. If we are doing all these things, uh, then we feel that we are obedient. And we may think, okay, I'm going to come to prayer. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And all of a sudden, because we're, we're doing it, we're kind of feeling a little bit righteous about ourselves. And that's the danger that we can't fall into. It's not just doing the things. It's more a matter of having the right attitudes, having the right heart, maintaining right relationships. It wasn't just what the church in Jerusalem did that Luke is trying to convey. It was how and why they did, did these things. Right? So we cannot do these things to tick a box. This would be the wrong motivation. Now, I'm, I'm trying to get to the core of my message here. Breaking the selfie, making the selfless. All these things that we have looked at, all these things that we have looked at, emphasize thinking of others and not yourself. These four things that the church was doing cannot be done by somebody who is selfish. The things need to be done out of genuine love for God and people. If we are doing them to please men or, or to be seen by men, we're doing these as rituals, like the rich young ruler once again. The rich young ruler had a bunch of rituals in front of him. I want to make sure that I can tick all the boxes. Now, the activities that, were, that are named, the teaching, uh, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers, were all corporate activities and things that the church did, to, did together. And uh, do you remember a passage where uh, the disciples were competing with themselves and they were wanting to see who was greater in the kingdom, all that was gone. Because they were no longer thinking about, I'm greater, I want to do this, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be. It was more about, how can I help you? Who needs help? Who needs prayer? And the focus was no longer in that, so all that disappeared. Um. The church in Jerusalem was characterized by joyful celebrations of all that they did. Um, in Acts, once again, 2.46 and, and 47, verse 47 says, Praising God and having all the goodwill of the people, and the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. Now, I wonder how can a church grow if its members are selfish? We have a church in the book of Acts who was thinking of others in prayer, thinking of others in fellowship, thinking of others by preaching the gospel and bringing salvation, thinking of others by being in fellowship and meeting each other's needs. No wonder they grew because, hey, I'm sure that the, the word got around and they said, hey, you know what? You need this. Come over here. These people will help you. How can a church grow if its members are selfish? What do we need to get there? How do we get there? These four characteristics is loving others and not yourself. Let's go to John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Now I'm, I'm starting to get to where I want to get to. I had to lay a little bit of a foundation It says this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, so also you love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, I, um, 
I was listening to a message by Craig Rochelle. He has a new book called uh, Hashtag Struggles, Following Jesus in a Selfie-Centered World. And he preaches it very well. He gave some of these facts. And I believe that these are only some of the facts that the church in 2015 uh, is struggling with. Okay, now his focus is, is uh, social media, but listen to the effects that social media has had on our society today. 93 million selfies are taken every day. 93 million selfies are taken each day. Now, selfies cause us to be self-centered. Jesus did not call us to promote ourselves, but to promote him. He called us to deny ourselves. Now, look, I don't, want to ma- I don't mean to make anybody feel bad. All right? This is, these, these, are, these are notes that, uh, that, that I've, I've got from uh, Craig Rochelle, and, and he's addressing an issue that I believe the church struggles with. Now, am I saying that because you take selfies, you don't think about other people? I'm not saying that. I'm saying about the effects that this has had on our society and how it could have a wedge also in the church. Um, Now, we are becoming addicted to immediate gratification. And uh, he says it like this, well, I'm feeling lonely right now, so I'm going to take a selfie and I'm going to post it, and then every five minutes I check to see how many likes I have. And then uh, in, in 10 minutes, you know, oh, I get a comment. Oh, I like your haircut. I like the way you look. Oh, your new dress, beautiful. Your new car. And, and, uh, and yes, and we are basking in the likes. We are basking in, in, the, uh, in all the credit and all the wonderful things that are being said about us. And so what happens, hey, you know, you were feeling a bit down, you were feeling a bit sad. I'm going to put a selfie up and, you know, make myself feel good again. Get other people to make me feel good because it's all about. So then what happens, look at this. We've got, we've got the, uh, <laughs> the fun part of the message. We've got the, uh, the, uh, the church in the book of Acts the disciples have, have uh, let go of all the I'm um, greater and all that stuff. And now they're thinking about other people and ministering to other people. The Lord is blessing the church. And in 2015, now we uh, take a selfie and uh, then somebody else takes a selfie. And then we start to compare uh, their selfie with our selfie and how many likes they got and how many likes I got. And uh, maybe we looked, uh, we, we pictured, uh, maybe we took a photo of the sunset and someone else took a photo of the sunset and you think, well, how come he's got more likes? My sunset's better. Right? And, and, and we've got the church and book of Acts serving people and, and the, the disciples letting go of that superiority thing. And we have the church in 2015 comparing ourselves to each other and, and breeding envy because, you know, you, you got more likes than me and, and, the, and this person liked your photo and they didn't like my photo. So then come Sunday at church and uh, then you're trying to avoid that person. You didn't like my photo. <laughs> Now, here is uh, some shocking stats. Experts are saying that because of social media, we care less about other people than we did in the past. There are studies that are showing a sharp decrease in empathy. The study shows that that we as a generation care about 40% less than what people cared in the 80s. 40% less. We are the generation of I, I, I. I'm looking at these stats. I'm looking at these statistics. That, that's big. That 40% less? I'm looking at these statistics and I'm thinking, where are the pastors going to come from? 
because the pastor is meant to care for people. And you're telling me that this generation that is so self-centered that, God, you're going to raise pastors out of this? There are things that need to be broken, church. There are things that need to be broken in order for the church to evolve and look like what it needs to look like. It's a struggle. It is a struggle. This decline of uh, empathy is a result of unintended consequences of social media. There is an overwhelming exposure to suffering that is desensitizing us. Now, this is what Craig Rochelle said. He said that when you're, when you're looking at your feed in your phone, he's so funny. He, he says, uh, uh, maybe you'll see the picture of a monkey, you know, doing something funny. Oh, praise God, you know, you like it, you share it and everything. And then right, on, right under that, you may see terrorist attack in Paris, you know, and then under that you see what's, what somebody's having for lunch. And so when you're scrolling through, you're actually seeing all these things. And how many of you know that you can just go and you can just flick and stop until the things that interest you when you want to see? And so now we're living in a day in which uh, evil uh, is, is so uh, gruesome and so evident it feeds into our social media and it begins to take the same place of category or, or importance or unimportance um, because the, 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 what you get in your feed is everything's the same size. So you see somebody's nice picture the same size. You see somebody posting a, a gruesome video of somebody getting killed all over the world is the same size. And you keep scrolling and scrolling. So your brain begins to desensitize from the big deal that things should have and the small deal that things should have. So priorities uh, are getting rearranged so to where we are becoming desensitized. And so because we become desensitized, you come along and tell me that you're going through this or maybe somebody posts, oh, I've just lost my job. Now, you think about the significance of, of uh, somebody losing their job. They're not going to be able to pay their bills. They're going to struggle with, with food. They're going to struggle, right? Desensitized. Because we're looking for, for self play We're looking for something to, to make us feel good. Desensitized. A lack of personal interaction makes it easier not to care. The early church had fellowship. They broke bread. They cared for one another. They had all things in common. Uh, but, you know, if, if you are going through a tough time or something and you post it and, and then, you know, well, I may give you a like or a little word of encouragement. Don't worry, brother. But, but how much does that do? Because once again, it's different for me to know and like your comment and tell you, yeah, I'm sorry about your job or this. That's one thing. It's another thing to inconvenience myself and go and visit you and go and pray for you and maybe take you out for a meal. Hey, look, let's talk about this and minister to you. What, what do you get more out of? Do you get more out of my like or do you get more out of my visit? The fellowship the fellowship that the church would do. Amen? True compassion demands action. Jesus was moved by compassion. Every time you see the word compassion, it is always tied to an action. Giving like, and, and what I said, giving a like to someone uh, who's posted something unfortunate is like not caring at all. The more we obsess over ourselves, the less we care about other people. The more we obsess about Jesus, the more we will care about other people. Here are three qualities of compassionate people. Number one, compassion interrupts. And, that, and that's what I, what I was trying to say to you. Is that, hey, you know what? I'm going to go out of my way 
I'm going to leave things aside. This happened to Jesus all the time. He was on his way to heal a little girl, and then somebody interrupted him. He stopped. He, you know, he was preaching one time, and some crazy guys lowered somebody and interrupted his message. They lowered a paralytic, and he stopped. That's compassion. How many times do you stop, Michael? the church that we need to become here is some good news oh number two sorry so compassion interrupts i'm forgetting about my powerpoints here number number two compassion costs and uh, we see uh, the, the good samaritan the example of the good samaritan uh he you know put somebody up and he paid for all their bills and everything compassion will cost you something and number three, it changes lives. Compassion changes lives. And so here is some good news. Because we live in such a self-centered world, the contrast of God's love versus, love versus self, uh, selfishness will become much greater to the point that if we do it right, people are going to look at, at us and say, I've never seen such degree of love. That's what Jesus said. He said, you guys, if you guys can just love one another and you can love other people, you will shock the world, especially in a day like today. Um, so maybe this is the reason that we may not be seeing some fruit is because maybe we are a little bit too self-consumed. How do we get out of this? How, how, how do we get God to break the selfie in us? We need to break the selfie and let God make the selfless. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, it says this, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are a potter. And all we are the work of your hands. Galatians 4.19 says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. And so, sometimes we like seeing other people being formed. <laughs> yeah, that brother needs that word. <laughs> come on, Lord, come on. Oh, preach it, pastor, preach it. Are you listening, sister? <laughs> right? And we, we like other people being shaped. And, and because, you know, we, we don't... Uh, not concerned about us, ourselves in that manner. We want to do what we want to do. But it's, it's no fun when you're getting formed. Here is the problem. Here is... A, here is oh, this is, this is heavy. If the clay dries, it can't be formed. And so, you know what dries us? When we're consumed with ourselves and we become desensitized, we are drying. We are drying. When we, uh, you know, are, are not too worried about the way we're living, we are drying. We are becoming hard. And God in His mercy that wants to shape you and mold you to become what He wants you to become can no longer softly make you so He needs to break you for love once God has shaped you into what he wants you to become then comes the fire and so when we go through the fire we need to make sure that we don't buckle. We need to make sure that we don't get out of shape so that we come out the other side just the way that he intended. That we become the vessels that he wants to use. I uh, was thinking about this and I was comparing uh, a vessel to a, a glass. What is a glass? How does a glass function in your home? Why did you buy that glass? Why did somebody make that glass? Shh, 
pour in, pour out. Pour in, pour out. How many of you have a glass at home that you pour in and it's just sitting there? Just for that. You, you just bought a glass because you wanted a glass of water sitting in your kitchen or somewhere and it's just, that's it. That's the function of the glass. Now, if you, if you bought one of those glasses just for that and you bought it five years ago, what's the color of the water like? The vessels that God makes are intended for pouring in, pouring out, pouring in, pouring out. But now, in the selfie society, pour in, pour in, pour in, overflow, pour in, pour in, overflow. I had never seen this verse that I'm about to show you and uh, I, I didn't fall on my back because there was no mattress to catch me. Have a look at this. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 15 to 17. And he died for all that those who live, are you alive? Should live no longer But for him who died for them and rose again. I hadn't seen, I've been a Christian for many years, I'd never seen that. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And so... Cancel all your plans because your life is not yours. It's a bit extreme. I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that how about we just begin to ask Jesus, how does this look like, Lord? How does how I no longer live for myself? Your plans are not my plans. Your will and not my will. That is, that's probably, we, we can start there. Living for him. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him, thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Um, going to this verse now, Colossians 1, 16 to 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And so all things consist in him. Jesus is at the core of everything. Jesus is at the core of everything. Now, the verse says that he who is in Christ is a new creation. What does that look like? What does it look like to be in Christ? Jesus said, if you abide in me. What does that look like? Because it definitely doesn't look like Jesus being an accessory that we go to when we need him. Well, I need you in this situation. I need you now. Come over here, Jesus. Okay, I don't need you. I want to enjoy myself. I'll leave you on the shelf. That's not abiding in Him. Abiding in, in Him is to continually acknowledge Him every day of your life, every second, and you're breathing Him, and you are very, very aware that He's with you, and because you're very aware that He's with you, you are walking in the fear of God. That is to abide in Him. Galatians 5, 1 to 6 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which God, by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man that who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. 
You have become estranged from Christ, you who have tend to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Now, let me explain this uh, a little bit. Uh, what Paul is saying here is that there were some people that had already accepted the gospel and uh, then they said, or they were preaching, you know what, okay, you've accepted the gospel, but you also need to be circumcised. Now, what Paul is saying here is, he's saying, hang on, guys. Because are you saying that the, the grace of God is not enough? A and now we go back to the doing, the rituals of doing. And so you, you cannot do something to be justified. You're already there. Now I go back to the four things that the church needs to do. Or, you know, how? With what motives? It's definitely not for righteous. Please don't walk for righteousness. Don't walk out of this place thinking, well, I've got to come to prayer. I've got to, you know, have fellowship with someone. Don't walk out of this like that. Because if you have, you've, you've missed it. What Paul is trying to say here is the same thing. It's not about the doing. You have the grace. You don't need to work for it to get it. All you have to do is impart it to others. Let it go. Don't put a yoke on somebody. That is what he's saying. If you do this, you have become estranged from Christ. This is not what Christ is about. This verse will explain this really well. 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to close soon. It says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have no love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains, but have no love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to, the, uh, to feed the poor, listen to this. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, but have no love, it profits me nothing, and so on and so on. I like the part it says that says here that uh, love does not seek its own in verse 5. So where, where does the change need to happen This is what I feel. I feel that God needs to break all our religious rituals and deposit love. Because when we have love, the, the other things will come naturally. So God to break the selfish. God to break the love for ourselves that we have and replace it with love for people, love for others. Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Do you realize that the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said to him, what must I do? Do you realize that if that young man had had love, when Jesus told him to sell everything to feed the poor, he would have looked at the poor, he would have had compassion, like in the book of Acts, where they actually did sell everything to meet everybody's needs. When Jesus told him, go and sell everything and follow me, if he had love, he would have done it. He would have sold everything for the love of the people and for the love of Jesus. So what was really missing with him was love. What's missing in the church? We have plenty of love for ourselves do we have enough love for somebody else? Are we moved by compassion? 
my last verse. Go to this if you have your Bibles or your, your phones. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the following. This is a solemn pronouncement of one who has a firm grasp on the seven stars in the right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works as well as your labor and steadfast endurance and that you cannot tolerate evil. You have even put to the test those who ref refer to themselves as apostles but are not and have discovered that they are false. I am also aware that you have persisted steadfastly, endured much for the sake of my name, and have not grown weary. A church that was doing some of the right things. But look at this. But I have this against you, that you have departed from your first love. Listen to the, listen to the next verse. Therefore, remember from what state you have fallen and repent. And this, this, is, what, this is where it is. Do the deeds you did at first. Do the deeds you did at first. From a church in the book of Acts that was caring for one another, that was, you know, they had love for other people. They had lost it. And God is saying, you've lost it. Go back and do as you were doing before. The only reason I gave you a list of things, church, is because I have no other way of giving you a picture of, of how it's meant to look like. But we cannot take it as, as a to-do list because if we do, then we're in the same boat as, as that 2 Corinthians 13, that if we do all these things and have no love, it profits me nothing. The early church in Jerusalem may not be the perfect pattern for all we do as a church today, but is an excellent example of a church that is marked by love. Love for God and love others. I would pray that our church would not only do the, th the right things, but that it would do them as acts of genuine love for God and for others. May we be characterized by the devotion or generosity and joy that we find in the early church to the glory of God.